questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. John Shrigley, pathology lead at the Kidding Partnership Against Cancer and Chief Medical Director of the Program of Lab Medicine and Genetics at Trillium Health Partners. On behalf of uh, CPAC, Cancer Care Ontario, and the Canadian Association of Pathology, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's CAP Checklist Education Session on Ovarian Cancer. Before I introduce our speaker and we get underway, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items. Firstly, the session is being recorded and a link to the recording will be circulated to all participants via email when it becomes available. Secondly, both the live presentation and uh, recorded presentations are eligible for CME credits. Information for obtaining credits can be found in the session notice. Please note that the CME certificates for each of the CAP checklist education centers uh, sessions will only be issued for one month from the presentation date. Please refer to the session notice for the exact deadline date. Please note that everyone's line has automatically been muted, been muted for today's presentation. We have a large number of participants that will not be able to troubleshoot any WebEx issues as part of this call. If you're experiencing technical difficulties, please call the WebEx support line. We encourage you to submit uh, questions at any time during the presentation using the chat feature. With, within the WebEx, uh, chat instructions can be found in the session notice. During the question and answer period, um, a session moderator will pose the submitted questions on your behalf for as long as time permits and in the order in which they appear. In the chat window, would you please include uh, your institution's name, uh, the name of the person posing the question, and finally your question. It is now a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Boyana Georgievich. Uh, Dr. Georgievich is a gynecologic uh, pathologist at the Ottawa Hospital and Assistant Professor at University of Ottawa. She received her MD degree at University of Alberta, did her anatomical path training at University of Toronto. She holds fellowships in gyne gynecologic pathology and cancer biomarkers from MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, the primary focus of Boyana's uh, research has been on the discovery of prognostic and predictive markers in endometrial carcinoma as well as their validation and adaption for clinical use. Boyana is the author of numerous publications and abstracts and several book chapters. She has lectured nationally and internationally and in 2013 was the recipient of the Stephen F. Vogel Award from the United States and Canadian Academy of Pathology. Dr. Georgievich uh, uh, served as a member on uh, expert panels for CPAC and also the College of American Pathologists. So without any further ado, I introduce Dr. Boyana Georgievich uh, to give today's talk on ovarian cancer. Boyana. Thank you very much, Dr. Shrigley, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to see you today. And I would also like to thank the uh, Cancer Care Ontario, um, CAP, and the CPAC for sponsoring uh, these sessions. So, um, today's session will be about the um, Protocol uh, for examination of specimens from patients with primary tumors of the ovary or the fallopian tube. Uh, it was released in January uh, of this year, and this is based on the uh, seventh edition uh, of AJCC uh, as well as FIGO 2014. Um, just want to point out before we get started that there will be a lot of screenshots of the actual protocol. Uh, throughout this presentation, and really the intent here is that if you've had a chance to download this protocol and read it to sort of help you follow along uh, the protocol itself. Um, the session today will focus on um, primarily updates to the protocol. There's really a lot of information to get through. Um, so we'll start by discussion of, on primary tumor site assignment. Then we'll um, talk about changes in staging systems, um, physical uh, type classification, um, grading, uh, classification of implants, and new area um, regarding the chemotherapy response score. And then we'll talk about growing guidelines, uh, not so much in terms of the entire growth, but how the growing guidelines are changing a bit as a result of these updates, and we'll finish off by a brief discussion um, uh, to, about the approach to bilateral ovarian 
brain tumor um, involvement. Uh, I just wanted to also point out that we have a um, very healthy representation on uh, the author panel uh, by Canadians, Dr. Blake Jilks from Vancouver and Dr. Patricia Baker uh, from Winnipeg, and also a lot of the updates that you will see presented today result from some uh, excellent scientific work by Canadian researchers and authors. So this is something uh, that we as, as a community of Canadian pathologists um, can be very proud of. So the, you will notice that this protocol is actually called ovary or fallopian tube. So let's get started with that. Um, about in a decade or so, there's been a recognition from observational data and also from molecular um, data that high-grade serous carcinoma um, really of, of the fallopian tube, ovary, and the peritoneum really derives from the fallopian tube in the majority of cases. So I know 2014 has acknowledged uh, this and essentially has fused the ovarian and fallopian tube uh, answer checklist. Um, with this juncture that, you know, while the actual selection of the primary site for high-grade serous carcinoma, whether it's ovarian or fallopian tube, has a relatively low impact on patient management, uh, it's still recommended because it provides accurate information for cancer registries and clinical trials. So this is a table that uh, has been adapted from a couple of recent publications deal with recommendations uh, to primary, uh, site, for primary site assignment. And initially, the, the summary of this table is that when you are dealing with high-grade serous carcinoma, um, with have a concurrent fallopian tube lesion, an ovarian lesion, uh, the default primary site is the fallopian tube primary. And this is sort of a conceptual departure from what we've been, most of us have been taught at some point in our training. So this is irrespective of whether there is fallopian tube carcinoma that is invasive or whether it's in situ. And it's also regardless of the size of the ovarian tumor, pattern of ovary involvement uh, or presence of peritoneal disease. Now, you have excluded a lesion in the fallopian tube and the lesion in the ovary, then that type of lesion is now designated as an ovarian primary. Only if there are no ovarian or fallopian tube lesions, but they have peritoneal disease, then that is a per peritoneal primary. So it's sort of an algorithmic um, approach um, of exclusion, if you will. Now, there are small samples, particularly core biopsies or some post chemotherapy specimens that show no residual disease, that these donations cannot be made accurately. In those cases it, is, cases, it is acceptable to designate the tumor as basically a tubal ovarian primary. Now, we should be aware of a couple of diagnostic pitfalls when applying uh, this approach. So this approach, again, applies to uh, tumors of the fallopian tube, ovary, and peritoneum. Uterine serous carcinoma is, a, is a di in a different category. So when you have a tumor that the bulk of the tumor is located in the uterus, there is a concurrent um, fallopian tube ovarian um, lesion. Most commonly, these represent a metastasis um, from the uterine tumor to um, for uh, genital sites. Um, it's useful sometimes to use WT1 in the setting as most serous carcinomas will be, serous carcinomas will be negative for WT1 with a variable uh, ER staining profile, whereas the majority of fallopian two primaries are um, WT1 positive and estrogen receptor positive. Uh, one other proviso 
though, is that we have uh, occasionally cases of tubarian carcinoma that have mucosal involvement of the endometrium or even in the cervix. So this is sort of this retrograde mucosal spread of upper genital tract lesions. So to show you a couple of these examples, so here is a steer carcinoma um, that is um, located in the endometrium with a deep uh, involvement um, or even of the myometrium. It is WT1 negative. And in the same specimen, um, here's a, a fallopian tube that really is looks like something that you might want to call a serous tubal intraepithelial carcinoma. However, this lesion is also WT1 negative. So this was interpreted as a metastasis from the endometrium. Um, here's an example of a case of, of a patient that actually presented on, as a um, renal carcinoma of a, on a pap smear. Subsequent endometrial biopsies reveal um, this carcinoma. Uh, and on the hysterectomy, it actually turned out that there, was, there were multiple foci of endometrial intramucosal tumor, uh, as well as almost a complete differential involvement of the mucosal surfaces of the cervix. And uh, in fact, this, uh, this tumor uh, derived from fallopian tube um, invasive uh, carcinoma, high grade serious carcinoma. So we're going to change gears now to staging. So the FIGO um, has upda updated uh, itself in 2014. However, TNM has not changed, uh, but will be changed to realign with FIGO in the future. And in fact, if you uh, if you uh, look at the protocol, it actually states that until the release of the eighth edition of the AJCC staging system. Um, of the primary should be based on the AJCC seventh edition staging manual. So one change in this current CAP checklist is that FIGO was not in the previous checklist, but it is actually listed as an optional um, uh, staging system. And um, in, in this list, FIGO merges ovary and the fallopian tube, whereas the TNM uses a separate checklist for ovary and the fallopian tube. Start with the FIGO because I think it's actually easier to start with it and then move on to the TNM. So what are the changes to FIGO? Well, one change in FIGO is that um, the, there is a subdivision of the 1C category. So uh, two limited to one or both ovaries or fallopian tubes with any of the following, and then surgical still intraoperatively, rupture of capsule, and malignant cells in ascites or peritoneal washings are designated as separate category. You will also note that um, the positive peritoneal cytology in this system is, a, is in the 1C category, and the 2C category that used to be in the old FIGO is now gone. Uh, another thing that has changed in the new FIGO is the addition of a lymph node only category. So we now have um, a combination of positive uh, lymph nodes, metastases, uh, that either measure less than or equal to 10 millimeters or greater than 10 millimeters. Also, the pleural effusion uh, cytology, positive cytology in the FIGO system is designated as 4A. Okay, so let's on now to TNM. So essentially, TNM, uh, you have to first identify that you are dealing with a high-grade serious carcinoma, then you're going to follow the primary site assignment rules, and based on that, you will decide whether you're using the T for ovary or T for the fallopian tube. Then the N and the M of the TNM are the same. Ovary, it not much has changed, but just in comparison to the FIGO, uh, you will notice that the positive peritoneal cytology in the TNM appears both in the T1 and the T2 categories. T1 
will also notice that there is not a lymph node only category. Positive lymph nodes in the TNM are in the T3C category, uh, and that's also an N1, uh, and they sort of share this category with peritoneal metastasis beyond pelvis, measuring greater than two centimeters in the greatest dimension. Um, so the low into side of the T of the TNM is actually pretty similar. So again, the positive peritoneal cytology appears in the T1 as well as in the T2. And again, we have this shared oops, category uh, with the uh, peritoneal metastasis. Moving to the TNM, so um, this is the, the NX, N0, and N1. This is the original and the addition of the N. However, actually, inspired by the file, the TN has now added this subcategory of N1A, N1B, and we're here distinguishing the size of the lymph node metastasis. Again, 10 millimeters is the magic number. Finally, moving to the N. Um, the positive plural cytology in the N1 is essentially the equivalent of the uh, 4A in the FIGO. So now we actually have additional reporting elements in the protocol that are relevant to the staging. Uh, so there is a category for peritoneal acidic fluid and also for plural fluid. And note here, for both of these categories, you have the option that this was not performed, but you you will hack off one of these options. Um, going on to our next topic um, is the histological type classification. And just to to put things in the in the correct perspective here, as we've talked about already, a histological type designation affects items on the checklist, uh, uh, namely uh, the consideration of primary site assignments for high-grade serous carcinoma. His level type of classification also affects the grading scheme that will be used, and we'll get into the discussion of that in a moment. So the histological classification uh, that we're using uh, now in the current checklist is based on this 2014 WHO classification, and um, I, I also up the WHO 2003, which was the previous classification that, you were that we were using, so that you can appreciate the differences. So one of the differences is that in the previous classification, serous carcinoma was a single entity, and then in the grading scheme, you would select whether it was high grade or low grade. We now have low grade and high grade carcinoma occurring as seven distinct histological entities. Another change has been the change to the classification of mucinous tumors. So we'll recall that in the previous classification we had a mucinous borderline tumors which could either be of intestinal type or endocervical type. Um, Still now being reclassified uh, in a sense that what we used to call intestinal type is now just called mucinous, and what we used to call endocervical type is now called seromucinous. All the previous classification, we had a um, joint category for mucinous carcinoma, but mucinous carcinoma now basically follows what the borderline tumors are doing. So we have mucinous carcinoma after the the mucinous intestinal type, and we have the serous mucinous carcinoma after the endocervical uh, mucinous type. Uh, in, the, um, in the old WHO, uh, we had a category of uh, transitional cell borderline tumor and transitional cell carcinoma. These categories have now been eliminated uh, due to recognition that transitional cell carcinoma is essentially a variant of high grade serious carcinoma. Squamous carcinoma is also gone. The new categories that appear in the WHO 
2014, is carcinoma subtype cannot be determined. We are going to talk about this category in a moment. Uh, carcinosarcoma was in the previous classification. However, now we're being asked to specify the uh, epithelial component and the amount of the epithelial component, as well as to designate whether the sarcomatous uh, component is either homologous or heterologous in type. Uh, a couple of other new categories include carcinoma arising from a teratoma, as well as mixed malignant germ cell tumor, whereby we're asked to specify types and percentages of tumor. I'll also turn your attention to another category, and that is mixed epithelial borderline tumors and mixed epithelial carcinomas. They were in the previous category uh, in the previous classification, but we will talk about them a little bit because there's some new insights into what these uh, tumors are. What's about ovarian carcinomas? So what, um, what studies over the last decade or so have shown is that most ovarian carcinomas are of uniform histotype. Uh, it has been shown that the histotype correlates with differences in biology, behavior, prognosis, and management um, of these tumors. Um, it's also been shown that histotype can be uh, reproducibly classified. This is not really the topic of this lecture, but I thought I would include it for completeness. Um, if, if we're unable to classify the tumors, sometimes based on histological criteria alone, there are helpful uh, immunohistochemical markers that can be used. And those include, for low-grade serous versus serous serous carcinoma, C53 and P16. Um, for n versus serous carcinoma, WT1 and P53. Uh, for clear versus serous carcinoma, WT1, estrogen receptor, absent A, HNF1 band, and one a um, For clear cell versus endometrial carcinoma, estrogen receptor, napsin A, and HNF1 beta. And finally, for endometrial versus mucinous carcinoma, estrogen receptor, and bimentin. So let us talk a little bit about high-grade versus low-grade serous carcinoma. And this is a shot directly out of the explanatory notes of the protocol. So the key concept here is that designating a tumor as high-grade serous carcinoma versus low-grade serous carcinoma is not an assignment of grade based on a continuum. These are biologically very different uh, lesions uh, and has a different uh, treatment and different prognosis. So what we, the main criterion that we use to distinguish high grade versus low grade serous carcinoma is the nuclear variability. And this is a greater than threefold um, variation in nuclear size in, uh, you will find high grade uh, serous carcinoma versus low grade. Uh, again, in cases where there may some difficulty with applying this, one can use the mitotic count of greater than 12 mitosis per 10 high power fields or you know, histochemical markers, as we mentioned already. So going back to the this new category that's in the 2014 WHO carcinoma subject cannot be de determined. Uh, category uh, it, it was put in because it, it's recognized that sometimes, particularly where you may not have um, a lot of tissue, uh, definitive diagnosis of uh, histotype may not, not be possible. However, uh, it's also stated that, you know, the, this category should be reserved for very infrequent um, situations and every effort should be made to classify, subclassify the tumors. All right. So, segue now into a um, brief discussion about mixed carcinomas, and I, I wanted to talk about this because there, there are some interesting new insights into uh, what what to do with these um, types of tumors. So um, recently, there was a very um, good study done by the Vancouver group, which looked at a very large cohort of um, carcinomas, epithelial carcinomas of the ovary, um, and they found that in fact, true mixed carcinomas represent less than one percent of uh, epithelial 
endothelial ovarian cancers. Um, these mini carcinomas may arise in the background of endometriosis, um, and they consist of morphologically distinct components that exhibit immunohistochemical profiles that are characteristic of each component. Um, it's actually very interesting that this study is showing is that components of mixed carcinomas often share the same ancestral molecular abnormalities. So there's no predict criterion for diagnosis per se. However, relative percentages of different components as per protocol requirements should be reported. So the situations regarding mixed carcinomas that I think a lot of us uh, who do geopathology struggle with is um, tumors that have so-called hybrid features. So an example of this would be a, an endometrioid carcinoma with clear cell changes, or endometrioid carcinoma with papillary architecture. So um, this did not a true mixed carcinoma. Similarly, tumors that have histologically distinct areas, but those areas exhibit the same immunohistochemical phenotype are also not true mixed carcinomas. True carcinomas have to have histologically distinct areas, and those areas have to have uh, different immunohistochemical profiles. So an example of, of a case that actually we had recently in our service, this is a tumor that actually arose in the background of an endometriotic cyst, and you will see here that there, there are areas that um, have a lot of uh, potting and tufting of the endometrium, and then there are other areas that look quite uh, glandular, and then there are still other areas uh, that exhibit invasion into the underlying stroma with a very pronounced desmoplastic response. Um, so when we when we were looking at this tumor, uh, what we knew is the nuclei were low to medium uh, cytological atypia, um, and in, in a lot of areas they still did maintain some intraepithelial clarity. But then there was this very pronounced clearing of the cytoplasm, particularly in these areas uh, that in these uh, glands that were invade, invading into the underlying stroma. So when we investigated this tumor with immunohistochemistry, what became very obvious is that all of these morphologically different appearing areas actually had a uniform immunohistochemical profile. In particular, this tumor was positive for the estrogen receptor and negative for nanocin. So this was endometrioid in contrast, this is this, uh, an example from uh, uh, the paper that I refer to. Uh, here is an example of a true mixed carcinoma. So we have areas here that look histologically very, very distinct. Endometrioid carcinoma on one side and uh, clear cell carcinoma on the other. And in fact, by immunohistochemistry, these tumors exhibit um, uh, different immunohistochemical profiles. Interestingly, both tumors share a mutation uh, in the pic 3 ca gene. Okay. One last note about um, histological type classification, uh, as is also mentioned in the protocol, is that carcinoma histotype um, is uh, now also thought of in terms of association with syndrome. Know that um, high grade serous carcinoma, 25% uh, of these tumors are associated with a uh, breast mutation, and clear cell and endometrial carcinoma, about 10 to 20% of these tumors are associated with a germline mutation in mismatch repair uh, genes or Lynch syndrome. So while it is not become a standard yet to test all of ovarian. Uh, non uh, serous tumors with a mismatch repair immunohistochemistry. It's certainly been a trend uh, in uh, some institutions uh, towards this approach, and the protocol also refers to this testing. So, moving to grading now, there are two grading uh, schemes that we are presented with in the protocol. One is histological. 
biological grade uh, that go from cannot be assessed to well differentiated, moderate, moderately differentiated, and poorly differentiated. Um, and this one, according to the protocol, is required for all carcinomas, except for clear cell carcinoma and low and high grade serous carcinoma, as well as it's required for all uh, solely latex cell tumors. So the two tier grading system, which is now required for immature teratomas only. So when you actually read the explanatory notes, um, what is recommended for um, endometriosis adenocarcinomas of the ovary is that a FIGO type system that we use for endometrioid adenocarcinomas of the endometrium, uh, that we use that one, which is a um, based on the amount of solid growth. Uh, and also, as we know, if there is notable nuclear atypia, the grade of the tumor can be raised on the basis of this. Now, monetary notes also state the following. There are no defined grading systems in widespread use for the remaining histological types of ovarian carcinoma. Um, and so Gestalt three-part grading system can be used Acknowledging that this is not well validated. So, uh, so this is just something to keep in mind uh, if you are dealing with uh, these other types of tumors. Okay, so what is the two tier grading system for immature teratomas? Well, the grading of, uh, of immature teratomas was originally proposed back in 1994 uh, by uh, study of. Uh, by O'Connor and colleagues on a large cohort of uh, teratomas. And essentially, a grade one tumor um, is a tumor where immature elements occupy less than one uh, low power field in any one slide. Grade two, uh, the immature elements occupy one to three low power fields. And then grade three, they occupy more than three low power fields. The two-tier grade, grading system comes when we lump the grade two and the grade three tumors into one. So essentially, then the low-grade uh, tumors are those with immature uh, neuroepithelial elements in less than one power field, and everything else is high-grade. Um, also, that for immature teratoma, um, we mention to the implant. So if there is um, an immature neuroepithelial containing implant in a retinal deposit, for example, that would raise the stage of the tumor. However, mature glial tissue does not increase the tumor stage. Not really changed in terms of um, totally late cell tumors. Uh, grade, just for completeness, grade one tumors uh, are those that um, have open or closed tubules, grade two tumors, um, you're starting to see lobular aggregates, and grade three tumors, um, you are starting to see sarcomatous stroma. Okay, so we are now going down the list, and our next topic is implants. So implants are, are implant terminology is applicable to serous and serum mucinous borderline tumors only. So we have two types of implants, and, and this is where the change has come in. So formerly we had non-invasive implants and invasive implants. Now we only have uh, the what was called non-invasive implants, which are still divided into categories of epithelial and dermoplastic. Implants that were formerly referred to as invasive implants are now considered equivalent to low-grade serous or serum mucinous carcinoma. Uh, the change um, has resulted from a recognition that these types of implants confer poor pro prognosis. And in fact, now, the, if, you, if you were facing a serous borderline tumor in the ovary with invasive implants in the peritoneum, this tumor would be classified as a low-grade serous carcinoma. 
that though would give people a lot of trouble, so I thought it would be helpful to review this here. Um, and this is your typical epithelial type implant, uh, where you have an epithelial proliferation of uh, low-grade um, serous type cells that's just sitting on a surface of a structure, so omentum in this case. And in mind, I you should be able to basically scoop up this implant easily. The dendroplastic implant is all something that that is sitting on the surface and could be quote scooped up. But the difference here is that the, these epithelial proliferations are sitting in in a desmoplastic type stroma, so a, a fibrous appearing stroma. This is the form referred to in base implant, or now we would call this low grade serous carcinoma. So, this is a section of omentum, and you can see that percolating through this um, through the omentum, uh, so these are not things that you can scoop off, uh, are capillary uh, and micropapillary structures that are sitting in non epithelial lines. So that, that is uh, now low grade serous carcinoma. Our next topic is a discussion on the chemotherapy response score. This is something new, and it is op in a, an optional field in the protocol. And, uh, I imagine this is something that you will be asked by your clinicians to use or not to use, depending on their type of practice. Um, the chemotherapy response score applies to high-grade serious carcinoma. Um, it is assessed on a sectional momentum that shows the least amount of chemotherapy response. Um, chemotherapy response is defined as 1 through 3. Um, and, of course, you will note that in your TM descriptors, you will also be checking off the post-treatment category. So what are these um, CR categories? So CR, CRS1 is a tumor that is predominantly viable with no or minimal regret associated fibroinflammatory change. Uh, CRS2 does have um, a response uh, to the tumor, but there is also a readily identifiable and regular distributed viable tumor. Finally, CRS3, and this is really the most important one, as I'll uh, explain in a moment. Um, in CRS3, um, complete or near complete response with no residual tumor or minimal irregularly scattered tumor foci as in individual cells, cell groups, or individuals up to 2 milliliters in maximum size. I would encourage you to to find more about the uh, CRS um, uh, in this in this paper that was recently published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. This is a picture from this paper, and you can see how CRS one there is no practically no response to the tumor, as opposed to CRS three, where dominantly there's a fibro uh, inflammatory reaction. Oh, if you want to train yourself, the uh, Dr. Blake Jokes, Jokes group at uh, UBC hosts an inch archive uh, where you can um, look more of uh, examples of these cases. The therapy response score has been optimized and validated, and it correlates with progression-free survival and overall survival. It identifies patients with low probability of platinum resistance and this is essentially defined as progression of the disease in six months or less at the last adjuvant chemotherapy cycle. Um, this is uh, shown to be reproducible among pathologists. And this is why the CRS3 in, is in partic particularly important because you can see by these um, progression-free and overall survival curves that patients with a CRS score of three um, Significantly better. Um, so, uh, chemotherapy 
response score is uh, independent of the debulking fit, and uh, CRS3 has a 94% negative predictive value for platinum resistance. Okay, so now we're going to shift gears and talk about grossing guidelines. And again, there's there's a two higher pages in the current uh, protocol explanatory notes on grossing guidelines. So I thought it would be worth to discuss this, but with particular attention to how some of the updates that we talked about uh, affect the grossing guidelines. So um, for ovarian lesions, um, surface involvement is certainly important uh, to, to uh, detect and comment on, and it may influence both staining and treatment. Um, the protocol suggests that um, particularly uh, the following uh, uh, should be labeled for microscopic examination. So tumor on surface, adhesions, rucker site, and this is this is loosely reflecting uh, the ICO subdivision of the 1C category. That is new. Um, so, of course, history of intraoperative tumor rupture should be noted, and um, particularly if performing an uh, intraoperative consultation, it is no important to note the presence of lesions as the specimen may become too distorted for assessment. So, we have a fire alarm in our hospital going on. I hope that this doesn't continue. I hope it won't disrupt us too much. Okay, take this off now. Right, moving on to sectioning. So general recommendations for tumor sectioning are one section for one centimeter uh, of greatest tumor dimension. Now, in uh, cases of serous, serum mucinous, and mucinous borderline tumors, and borderline tumors with micropapillary or microinvasive foci, as well as solid teratomas or mixed malignant germ cell tumors, an increased number of sections at the discretion of the pathologist is warranted. The fallopian tube, there are basically three kinds of categories of lesions. So uh, we have the risk reducing cell tingoferectomies, and I think most of us already handle our specimens in this way. Uh, we follow the CSIM protocol. So basically, this in this protocol, we will section uh, the uh, fallopian tube fimbriate end uh, longitudinally and the remainder of the fallopian tube transversely and submit all sections in total. Tingoophrectomies for two ovarian masses with no or grossly visible fallopian tube lesions. Um, Some may still perform a season protocol for these as well, uh, but in the in the CAP protocol now, the recommendation is to submit symbrium in total and the remainder of sections representative. So both of these situations deal with high grade serous carcinoma and primary site assignment. Um, lastly, we have the grossly visible fallopian tube lesion, and this is Sectioning here is really at the discretion of the pathologist, but the goal is to determine lesional distribution and relationship to tubal epithelium. Um, omentum, uh, if the omentum is grossly involved um, and we're with a carcinoma, representative sections are sufficient. For carcinoma um, that has undergone post uh, neo or pardon me, I should say neo Four to six sections of, are required, and for borderline tumors and teratomas, um, multiple sections um, are advised, but the number is not specified in the protocol. For mostly normal um, omentum, five to ten sections are recommended. For skin biopsies, essentially the same principles apply. If there are, if there's gross involvement. Well then, representative sections are okay, but I think in, in in most of our experience, sometimes staging biopsies are very small and it's very difficult to appreciate whether they are grossly involved or not. So I think a lot of us will just submit them in total. Um, 
New fine tumors occur in conjunction with tubal ovarian tumors. Uh, there are no uh, strict guidelines as to what to do, but of course, this should be taken in order to document the extent of the tumor, uh, depth of myometrial invasion, and relationship to the tubal ovarian tumor. Uh, in red, rehab center, all uh, clear. Okay, so now uh, for lymph nodes, again, if they are grossly involved, representative sections in their system, and when they're um, grossly, when they're grossly involved, representative sections are sufficient, and when they're really normal, we submit them in total. And remember, now in our protocol, we, we are required to specify the size of lymph node metastasis. So moving on towards the end, um, we have um, the last uh, section uh, that again is discussed in the protocol, and I thought it would be uh, important to uh, touch on it briefly. And that is the approach to bilateral ovarian involvement. So there are actually three possibilities in this situation. One possibility is, is that both ovaries are involved by non ovarian metastasis. And so we've, we've talked about high grade serous carcinoma and primary site assignment, so that is. Certainly, one possibility. The other possibility is mucinous carcinoma, and we know that, that ovary is a frequent recipient of metastasis from the upper uh, and lower GI tract, the pancreatobiliary tract, even the breast. Uh, so, so, this possibility also has to be kept in mind. Other possible features include presence of peritoneal disease, history of congenital tumor in another organ. Of course, uh, and a pattern of ovarian involvement. So, multiple nodules, surface implants, involved hilar vascular spaces, or mucinous carcinoma signet ring cells. These are um, red flags. The second possibility involves primary tumor in the dominant ovary with metastasis to the contralateral ovary. Um, so, the contralateral ovary. Uh, we'll have the same histotype of tumor, the dominant ovary, uh, but will exhibit a metastatic pattern of involvement. The third possibility are synchronous primaries in each ovary. So in this um, possibility, both lesions will appear dominant grossly, and they will have a different histological appearance. So you will note that actually there is a there is a study in the protocol here that says the protocol applies to primary tumors of ovarian or fallopian tube tumors of two different histologic types are present. Separate case summaries should be used for each tumor. Um, so, so, so that's why these particular guidelines are relevant. All right, so um, to some extent, then, today we talked about uh, the update the uh, CAP ovary uh, and fallopian tube protocol. Uh, we discussed primary tumor site assignment, particularly with respect to high-grade serous carcinoma, and um, how fallopian tube is the default uh, primary site of origin unless there is no evidence of a fallopian tube um, lesion. We talked about staging and how FIGO has now fused the ovarian and fallopian to protocol, but we're still using separate protocols for TNM until the issue of the AJCC 8th edition. Um, we discussed the histological type classification, which now reflects the, the 2014 classification, and we talked about a new approach to some old entities like a mixed carcinoma. In terms of grain, um, our discussion centered around the fact that different tumors are graded differently and also that uh, grading of some tumors has a different degree of significance. We talk about the updated classification of implants, particularly um, the fact that what used to be called invasive implants uh, are now uh, equivalent to low-grade serous carcinoma. And previously, no non-invasive implants are uh, still uh, 
consider and they are of epithelial and mesoplastic type. We got a new feature on the checklist, the chemotherapy response score, the classification and the clinical implication, and particularly the importance of identifying CRS3, which has a, uh, a negative, high negative predictive value for um, platinum resistance. Uh, we have some grossing guidelines and how um, they have changed in the context of the checklist updates. And finally, we talked about the approach to bilateral ovarian involvement by tumor and when it is appropriate uh, to use separate case summaries. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I would also like to um, acknowledge um, Shere uh, Shereen um, Williams and Goran Klarich, um, who have uh, worked behind the scenes to organize these sessions, as well as uh, Dr. Shrigley and Dr. Aaron Pollitt, uh, and thank them for their support. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Georgievich. This is Shireen on the line. Um, we have some questions for you today, and thank you to everyone who has submitted a question. Our first question comes from Dr. Raymond Muang, and he asks, 10 HPF, how much will Will it be in terms of square millimeters? Can you repeat that question. Uh, Ten yeah. HPF. How much will it be in terms of square millimeters? How much will it be in terms of square millimeters? I, there's, it's a two, it might be a two-part question. So the other quest, the other part of this is nuclear variability. Is this based on nuclear area or nuclear diameter? Oh, 10 high power fields. Oh, sorry. I, I thought I, I thought I was hearing HPS. HPS. Uh, so so is this read the question, please? So um so 10 HPS. How much will it be in terms of square millimeters? Uh, are, are we talking about high grade versus uh, low grade serous carcinoma grading? I'm sure. So the other question that he had was nuclear variability. Is this based on nuclear area or nuclear diameter? So I'm not sure if these two questions uh, are this, together. This is, this is based on the overall tumor appearance. If, okay, so if I understand the question correctly, I think uh, the question is regarding the grading of uh, low-grade versus high-grade serous carcinoma, and uh, the um, not based on any one particular area. It's sort of based on the overall appearance of, of the tumor. And uh, obviously, uh, in the 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 most the the looking, I guess, uh, area of the tumor is what should be used if we're considering the designation of high-grade serous carcinoma. I hope I have understood the question. Okay, very much. Our next question comes from Anna Plotkin, and uh, she's from Credit Valley, and she asks, why do we need to assign site for HG serous carcinoma to be organ-specific, except endometrial serous carcinoma, rather than being disease specific and specify organs involved. Clearly, it is not important as the treatment is the same. Molecular alterations are similar. Yes. Well, I entirely agree with that and um, tried to sort of allude to that in one of my slides. Um, so the, the assignment of the prime site in this situation has low impact on uh, patient management, particularly in a setting of high state disease. Uh, but provide accurate information for cancer registries and clinical trials. So the, I, I guess the objective of this session was to convey what the cancer checklist now would like us to do, but I think it's, it's sort of a sit among, um, you know, um, other people that the particular assignment does not have uh, an impact on patient treatment. And um, and Dr. Plotkin also would like to say thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And I think that is our question, actually. Well, I'm 
info again for... Oh, well, I, I spoke a bit too soon. Okay. Um, so there is another question. So it's from Dr. Raymond Wong, and he's saying low-grade versus high-grade serous carcinoma. How do you determine three times nuclear variability? Is this by nuclear surface area or nuclear diameter on the slide? How nuclear might it go? That's the, that's the question, the original oh, question. I see. Nuc a nuclear diameter. Diameter. I thought, if I'm not going to speak too soon, then I think that is our last question. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Long muted. Line. Hi, Mr. Wrigley. Yes, sir. Please give our closing remarks. For sure. On behalf of CPAC, uh, Cancer Care Ontario, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Jurevich for our great presentation today. It was a really nice uh, review of the uh, fairly substantial changes in the uh, ovarian checklist uh, that have happened over the last little while. A reminder, both the live and recorded presentations are eligible for continuing education credits. In order to request your certificate of participation, please provide your name and email address at the link included in the session notice. Uh, here you will find, also find an optional session evaluation form, which we encourage you to complete. The information collected through this process will allow us to ensure that these sessions continue to be informative and relevant to your practice. We appreciate your feedback and suggestions. Please see the session notice for this information. And just to remind everybody, we have three sessions coming up. We have a melanoma session on April the 13th. That's going to be given by Dr. David Shum, a urinary bladder uh, session on April 27th that's going to be given by Dr. Theo Vanderquist, and a pediatric uh, rhabdomyosarcoma session that's going to be mainly sponsored by Canadian Association of Pathologists, CPAC, and the uh, Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario that's going to be given on May the 11th by Dr. Gino Summer. So we look forward to your participation in these three future sessions. Thank you very much for attending. Bye, everyone. Now. No.